Hi, this lecture video is on reproductive physiology, where I'll be covering an overview of both the male and female uh, reproductive organs. So I want to begin with an introduction of some, some terms and some basic concepts. Uh, first off, that reproduction is biparental, and that uh, you know, the male and female produce gametes, otherwise known as sex cells. And the, the gametes have to join to produce what we refer to as a zygote or a fertilized egg. So the, uh, so the gametes in a male are the sperm, and the gametes in the female are the eggs. So there's two things necessary for uh, reproduction. Is first off, the sperm has to be motile. You know, there has to be sperm motility because it has to travel. And that the egg usually has to be larger and contains uh, a lot of nutrients for uh, the, event, the eventual uh, possibility of you know, fertilization. And then uh, lastly, I just wanted to kind of touch on um, some definitions of sex uh, in terms of uh, male-female identity. Uh, so, for example, you have the more common phenotypic sex, which is, you know, um, uh, physical characteristics of a male or physical characteristics of a female. But then you have the uh, gonadal sex. And so the gonads are the ovaries in the female and the testes in the male. Uh, so that would be... Uh, another way in which we would uh, identify male from female. But then there's also the genetic sex, which is males have an XY chromosome, uh, chromosomes and the female have XX chromosomes. And, uh, you know, in, in certain cases, uh, you might have actually uh, somebody who is, let's say, um, XY, so genetically they're a male, and they, for some reason, they may not produce a lot of testosterone, or the receptors are not responding to the testosterone that's there during development, and so they're born with uh, uh, female genitalia. Uh, so in that case, you would have sort of a change of what would be like our gonadal sex versus uh, the genetic sex and so on. Okay, so chromosomal sex determination. Uh, our cells contain 23 pairs of chromosomes, and 22 of those pairs are what we refer to as autosomes. And then there's one pair of sex chromosomes. So as I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, there would be XY chromosomes in the male and the XX chromosomes in the female. Uh, the males produce half Y carrying uh, sperm and half X carrying sperm. Uh, the X and Y are separated from each other through a process known as meiosis. And all the eggs carry an X chromosome. And again, the, X, the, the two X chromosomes are separated from each other via a process known as meiosis as well. And so when a Y sperm fuses with the egg, it's going to pr uh, uh, produce an XY uh, set of sex chromosomes, which would become a male. If an X sperm fertilizes an egg, an egg then it would be an XX, which would be a female. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the sex hormones in the males versus the females. Uh, they're actually the same, same hormones found both in males and females. However, the quantities differ. Uh, so for example, in males have higher, higher amounts of testosterone uh, versus females having higher levels of estrogen, for example. So the androgens in males uh, are comprised of like testosterone, which comes primarily from the testes. And testosterone is important for uh, internal, the development of the internal genitalia in males. Um, which requires testosterone to actually signal during the uh, during development to maintain something called a Wolfian duct, uh, and to also to inhibit the Mullerian uh, the Mullerian ducts, and uh, <clears throat> so this will help promote the internal genitalia, such as the epididymis and the vas deferens, seminal vesicles, and so on. Uh, testosterone is responsible for libido and spermatogenesis, the production of sperm. Skeletal muscle growth, changing of the voice during puberty. There's also another type of testosterone or androgen, excuse me, known as dihydrotestosterone or DHT. And so this actually promotes uh, the formation of the external genitalia, such as the scrotum and the penis, for example. It also uh, is responsible for male pattern baldness, um, body hair like chest hair or facial hair, as well as prostate growth. Androstene down and DHEA are weaker androgens that are released from the uh, adrenal glands. The estrogens in males, uh, primarily estradiol and estrone, are they're produced mostly in peripheral tissues because they, these peripheral tissues contain an enzyme known as aromatase. Uh, 
and uh, the tissues that that contain it are adipose, skin, brain, and liver. Progesterone uh, is there's a small amount that's actually released from the adrenals as well as from the testes in males. In the females, uh, which you know they primarily have more uh, estrogen, estradiol and estrone, uh, particularly, come from the ovary and it helps to maintain the female reproductive organs during development. So it maintains the malarian ducts, for example. And uh, it's also responsible for growth of breast tissue, uh, helps to maintain pregnancies, which we'll discuss. And um, uh, some, some of the androstene down is converted to in the peripheral tissue as well in females. And so uh, it's the same tissue, adipose tissue, skin, brain, liver, contain aromatase enzymes to help produce uh, more estrogen from those areas. And it's not an insignificant amount. Uh, so for example, in adipose tissue, if we take um, you know, very well-trained uh, athletes um, or, or cases of, of very, very low body, uh, body fat conditions, or maybe in case of starvation, uh, they can actually have what we call amenorrhea or you know, lack of a menstrual cycle or a sexual cycle. Uh, due to the the uh, the lack of estrogen production uh, during pregnancy, the placenta produces another type of estrogen known as estriol, which is the least potent of the estrogens, uh, but is is relevant again and important for the the production and the growth of the uh, the fetus. Progesterone um, is produced by the corpus luteum of the ovary primarily. We'll discuss that in this lecture. And the androgens in females, uh, you know, there's usually at lower levels, and the adrenal production of androgen down and DHEA uh, make up for most of that. Uh, testosterone and androgen down um, are produced by the growing follicle in the ovary, and we'll discuss its role there as an intermediate to producing estrogen. So just briefly, uh, in terms of male development, just to kind of give you guys an idea. Uh, of what's happening here. The testes, okay, so here. So in the testes, we have two very important cell types, one known as the Leydig cell, and one is a Sertoli or a nurse cell. And the Sertoli cells produce uh, a malarian inhibiting factor. Now malarian, the malarian ducts in the female are what eventually become um, the, the female reproductive organs. And so it causes regression of the malarian ducts, Meanwhile, the Leydig cells, they produce testosterone, and the testosterone helps to promote the growth of the Wolfian ducts, as well as in the presence of an enzyme known as 5-alpha reductase. 5-alpha reductase converts testosterone into that other androgen known as DHT. DHT actually promotes growth of the urogenital sinus, which promotes the growth of the male external genitalia, as I mentioned on the previous slide. The Wolfian duct becomes uh, the internal genital organs for the male. And so kind of interestingly here to point out is that um, in females, in females if there's no, tos no testosterone, low levels of testosterone, uh, the malarian ducts are not inhibited and it becomes female reproductive organs. In the male, even if they're XY chromosomes, if they lack testosterone or are insensitive to testosterone during development, uh, the malarian ducts are not inhibited and it becomes female uh, reproductive organs. So the default in either case is actually female organs. Now this slide has a lot going on here. It's, it's showing you the, the structure of cholesterol here, that ring structure that's, uh, that's very recognizable, uh, and how cholesterol is the, the precursor to a lot of steroids. And so the uh, sex hormones that we've been discussing are steroid hormones produced from cholesterol. And this was discussed in my lecture video on the adrenal uh, glands. But here, okay, just to kind of remind you on, the, on some of the pathways, uh, this is pregnenolone, which is our next common precursor. And ultimately, we have one pathway here that can lead to corticosterone and also aldosterone. And from, if we're in the presence of our 17-alpha hydroxylase, we can convert that into cortisol. So the cortisol, corticosterone pathway there from the adrenal cortex. And then over here, what we do is we have um, DHEA and androstene dione, which can also be produced in the uh, cortex of the adrenal gland, as was discussed in that video. Now, in the, the presence of enzymes like 17-beta-HSD, 
it can convert that DHEA and interstein dione into testosterone, as well as into uh, dihydrotestosterone or DHT, which is the ones I just pre previously discussed on the last slide. So those are two forms of testosterone that are primarily produced, these two right here, testosterone and DHT, uh, in, the, in the testes. Now, um, in the female, as well as in the male, the adipose tissue, brain tissue, liver, and so on, they contain aromatase enzyme, which is right here. The aromatase enzyme can actually convert testosterone into estrogens like estrone and estradiol, which are the primary ones. Um, in the female, you can also see in the placenta, all right, during pregnancy, it also produced, they also produce estriol. So we have three different forms there. Uh, the most the most abundant of which are most potent of which is estradiol. Okay. And again, uh, males will also produce, um, you know, estrone and estradiol peripherally. Females also produce it peripherally as well in the same type of tissues, like adipose tissue, for example. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, the male reproductive system. And here uh, on the first slide, we're going to talk a little about the, um, the anatomy of the, the, the testes. So again, in the males, uh, the male gonads are the testes. And so you can see here, the testes actually um, reside outside of the pelvic cavity in the scrotal sac. And if we look at this cartoon, it's connected via what we call a spermatic uh, cord. And spermatic cord has uh, these structures like blood vessels, arteries and veins contained within that, uh, nerves, as well as something referred to as the ductus deferens, which you can see here, this ductus deferens also referred to as the vas deferens. And the ductus deferens is connected to this structure right here, which is known as the epididymis. And the uh, epididymis is actually where the sperm are stored uh, to also mature. So when they're first produced, they're not mature, they get stored in the epididymis and then uh, mature there and are stored there. Now looking at the, the testy itself, it's actually surrounded by this tunica albuginea, which is this so fibrous capsule. And you can see that it's actually inside that capsule, it's septated. You can see the septa here as I'm drawing it in. And those septa actually separate uh, portions of the inside of the testes into what we refer to as a lobule. And each lobule contains, uh, as you can see, these, this coiled up structure here, this coiled up tube known as a seminiferous uh, tubule. So the seminiferous tubule is actually where spermatogenesis takes place. This is where the sperm are being produced. And it's uh, a fluid-filled structure, so when it, they're produced, they're sent towards the, the what we refer to as the reedy testes over here, and then that gets deposited into the epididymis for storage and maturation. And then during ejaculation, it would leave the epididymis and go into the vas deferens or the ductus deferens and travel up the spermatic cord and into the into the pelvis. So the seminiferous tubules, so this is the coiled structures in those lobules in the testes, and this is where the sperm are produced. So uh, each tubule is um, lined with this thick, what we call a germinal epithelium, okay? And this is where the, the cells, these stem cells will become uh, sperm. And so they contain something referred to as a sustentacular cells. Now the sustentacular cells go by a couple names. They're sustentacular cells, Sertoli cells, or nurse cells. Uh, so I apologize in advance if I switch between some of those names. I'll try to be consistent. So these nurse cells, um, in between these, these nurse cells, uh, or I should say actually with the, the function of these nurse cells are to protect the germ cells, to protect the cells that are going to become sperm eventually, and it helps to promote and provide the nutrition for the development of the, the sperm there. And uh, it also helps to get rid of the wastes, helps with uh, providing growth factors and other needs of, that, of those germ cells. And uh, another important role that they play is that they actually form tight barriers between each other. And the testes actually, oh, excuse me, the germ cells actually develop in between uh, these tight junctions between the, uh, uh, the nurse cells. And these tight junctions have a very important role in providing what we call the blood testes barrier. Now, the blood testes barrier is similar to a blood brain barrier in that it, it prevents uh, you know, um, certain substances from being able to move in there. So for example, uh, 
uh, the immune system can't make contact with these germ cells because if they could, they would actually activate and destroy or kill off those germ cells because as uh, you know, foreign bodies. <clears throat> The, uh, the nurse cells are stimulated by FSH, or follicle-stimulating hormone, and they secrete inhibin as a negative feedback. So inhibin inhibits the release of FSH specifically. And the nurse cells, they also produce something called androgen-binding protein, which actually binds to testosterone. So the androgen-binding protein, when it's released, stays fairly local right there in the testes, and the testosterone that's produced, since it, it is a steroid, it can travel through membranes. Uh, it helps to keep testosterone levels concentrated within the testes there uh, by binding to this protein and remaining in what we call a dynamic equilibrium. So any free testosterone will get used up by the cells that are required for the development of the sperm. Um, and it will be in an equilibrium with what's bound to the protein. So the proteins will then release more. Uh, to make up for that, so you kind of have a, a constant replenishing source coming from the, the proteins that are holding on to the testosterone. The testosterone itself actually comes from the interstitial Leydig cells, which I mentioned actually a few slides earlier. Uh, so the Leydig cells, they're actually located um, between the tubules, and they produce testosterone, and they're stimulated by a luteinizing hormone. So the LH stimulates the Leydig cells to produce testosterone, as testosterone levels go up, the FSH will actually stimulate the uh, nurse cells. The nurse cells will release the androgen binding protein, which will bind to those testosterone to keep it at a good concentration for the developing sperm. Now, this is just a histological slide uh, looking at particularly a cross section through one of the tubules. This is just a cross section through the seminiferous tubule. And you can see it's hollow in the center, which are where it's white. Okay, and that red line that I just drew around is actually the connective tissue that's, uh, that surrounds the outside of the tubule. And then uh, there, there's a mix of you know, nurse cells, big nurse cells that uh, are connected to that connective tissue and can extend. So we can have nurse cells that extend all the way into that lumen. So they're, they're, they're quite big. In addition, you also have uh, our germ cells. Okay, so here are the germ cells. All right, and the germ cells when they're stem cells, okay, and haven't, aren't differentiating into sperm yet, they're located next to uh, the connective tissue on the outside there. And what they do is, as they're signaled to develop, they signal and progress towards the lumen in that direction to eventually become sperm, okay, to eventually become sperm in the lumen and then be shuttled over to the epididymis ultimately. And over here, you can see the interstitial cells or the Leydig cells, which would be releasing testosterone to help support these growing sperm. Okay, so a little bit more about the anatomy um, as it pertains to really the, the physiology of the production of sperm. Uh, sperm actually require a lower temperature than body temperature, usually anywhere from about one and a half to three degrees Celsius lower um, body temperature. So they actually, that's why they're not in the pelvic cavity, but actually hanging below the pelvic cavity in the scrotal sac. And so it's important to actually maintain that temperature for their optimal uh, development. And so there's a couple of things in place to help maintain that temperature. So for example, uh, here we can see the external inguinal uh, ring and you see the uh, cremaster muscle here. So this is the cremaster muscle. And so the cremaster muscle, actually extends all the way down around the testicle, which you can actually see on this side over here a little bit better, it goes and wraps around the testicle. And, and it, it's, it's actually an extension of the internal oblique muscle. And uh, one of its jobs to help maintain uh, temperature of the testes is that it'll actually constrict and bring the testes up close to the body when it's too cold. So it helps to warm them. And if it's, uh, if it's too warm, they'll actually relax and distend away from the body in order to cool off the testes. In addition, if you were to cut open, as it has, as you can see in this cartoon, if you cut open the cremaster muscle there, you can see the, uh, the veins there and the arteries, and the veins form a plexus. In fact, the name for that is called the pampiniform plexus, and it wraps closely around the arteries. And its function is very important. So what happens is that the arteries are bringing uh, 
warm blood to the testes and that blood is body temperature and that would actually negatively impact the development of the sperm. So this plexus of veins that are returning from the testes, they wrap around this artery and any of the heat that's given off by the, um, by the artery is actually taken up by the pampiniform plexus on its way away from the testes and actually takes the heat and transfers it back to the body. And so it's a, a counter current mechanism where the warm blood moving towards the testy, that warmth is taken away in parts, or some of the warmth is taken away in parts, or some of that heat is taken away in part by the pampiniform plexus uh, that's moving in the opposite direction. So it takes it back to the body so that the blood that's actually reaching the testes by the arteries is, uh, has been cooled somewhat. And then also you have what we refer to as the, the dartos muscle. All right, and so this is this is muscle uh, located within the uh, around the testes that can also um, contract or relax to help draw the testes either closer to the body or further away from uh, the body. And so that's what this slide here is is going over. You can see there's, there's the cremaster muscle, which I referred to before. Um, and so again, that's going to help modulate the, the, the temperature by contracting or relaxing. The dartus muscle, which is the subcutaneous layer of smooth muscle, contracts when cold, relaxes when it's, uh, it's warm. And then you have the pampiniform plexus. So again, that's our countercurrent heat exchanger, which I've underlined down here for you. This uh, helps remove heat from the descending arterial blood. So these are several mechanisms to be able to regulate the temperature for optimal sperm production. Now, with this slide, really what I wanted to just touch on was um, that during development, the testes have to descend out of the pelvis in order to make sure that um, we can regulate the temperature appropriately. And the descent, since they're actually formed, they're actually formed within the pelvic cavity initially during development. And you can see it's connected to the structure referred to as the gubernaculum on its inferior surface. So here's the testes that are circled. And there's a structure called the gubernaculum. And you can see the epididymis there, and you can see over here, this is the ductus deferens, which is the vas deferens. And so during development, that gubernaculum actually retracts. As you can see over here, it retracts. And an important structure I want to show you over here is this one too. It's called the pubic symphysis. So that's actually the, the anterior part of the pelvis there. So you see the testes is actually brought um, anteriorly over the, the pubic symphysis. And then as the gubernaculum retracts, the testes is pulled inferiorly and down into you know what the future scrotal sac is going to be right here right, and the ductus deferens or the vas deferens is elongated following that into the scrotal sac which eventually by the time they're about one month old this will really ha have sealed off and uh and under normal circumstances uh you know the testes should have descended either just prior to birth or within the you know the first month or so after birth, um, the danger of you know having non-descended testes um, after birth is the risk of um, infertility due to uh, to a higher temperature, but also uh, more severe than that is they also increase their risk for uh, cancer. In this slide uh, is showing the hormonal relationships between the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the testes. So let's pick a color here. It's yeah, somewhat easy to follow. Let's just see. I guess I'll stick with red. So here in the hypothalamus, all right, GnRH or gonadotropin releasing hormone is released and stimulates the anterior pituitary to release FSH and LH. So that's our FSH and LH right here. FSH, as I mentioned earlier, FSH is going to stimulate the nurse cells, otherwise known as sustentacular cells, and they are going to produce androgen binding pro, uh, protein, which is what the ABP stands for. Now the LH, the LH is going to stimulate the interstitial cells or the Leydig cells and they're going to produce testosterone in response to the LH. Now the nurse cells in response to FSH are going to release inhibin. Inhibin inhibits the release of FSH specifically. It doesn't affect testo uh, excuse me, it doesn't affect LH levels. So this is, is this has a, its own mechanism. So 
LH, on the other hand, LH, or luteinizing hormone, stimulates the lighting cells to produce testosterone. As testosterone levels increase, that's going to negatively, uh, uh, negatively feed back on the pituitary gland as well as the hypothalamus. And so that's going to reduce uh, the production of, of luteinizing hormone. Now, the testosterone will also bind to the ABP, which is going to help uh, in keeping concentrations high for stimulation of spermatogenesis. Testosterone levels as it rises is also responsible for uh, secondary sex organs, okay, secondary sex characteristics. Uh, we kind of mentioned some of that already with, you know, uh, increasing muscle mass, deepening of the voice, um, changes in hair, facial hair, chest hair, pubic hair, and um, also stimulation over here, which you can see in white, in libido and the, in the hypothalamus. Okay, so um, in regards to spermatogenesis, okay, so this is now uh, happening in the seminiferous tubules, and in response to FSH, LH stimulation of the nurse cells and the Leydig cells, they'll produce testosterone and help the production of the sperm. And so really this, this production involves three principal events where we go with from one stem cell, we produce uh, four sperm cells that have flagella so that they're so they have motility uh, we're going to need to reduce the, uh, the number of chromosomes by half so if we have 23 pairs uh, each of those four sperm cells should contain 23 chromosomes not 23 pairs but 23 chromosomes and so this is the difference between what we refer to as diploid and haploid so by definition uh, most of the cells in our body are diploid meaning they contain 23 pairs. The pairs meaning the homologous pairs, one from the mother, one from the father. Okay, so that's, um, uh, or one from the male, one from the female, excuse me. So this is what we refer to as diploid. Haploid means we've separated homologous pairs from each other. Okay, so by definition, a haploid cell has only one of those, of those pairs. Okay, <clears throat> so we need to make sure we separate homologous pairs and then uh, we need to shuffle genetic information so that the chromosomes contain you know, new gene combinations. And um, so this process is uh, referred to as crossing over, which is an important step for genetic diversity. And then finally, uh, just in terms of the, the semen, so the term semen actually uh, is the entire fluid that's e ejaculated which is on, on average about three to five milliliters and only about 10 percent or less is actually sperm so it's not entirely sperm it's it's about less it's about 10 percent or less um in terms of production by the seminiferous tubules it's about close to 100 million um uh sperm per milliliter and it produced they're produced daily uh, uh, and the sterility is usually defined as uh you know less than than 40 million um per milliliter per day. So if you're looking at an average of say three, three mils of uh, semen in an ejaculate, that looks, that's about, uh, about 300 million or so uh, sperm. Okay, to illustrate um, those three principal events, what we have is our single cell, okay, which is our stem cell, which is initially what we call 2N or diploid. Again, that just means that it has um, two pairs of chromosomes from the, from the male and the female. Now, ultimately with spermatogenesis, this stem cell, which starts out diploid, after undergoing meiosis one and meiosis two, which is a two-step process, it's going to result in four sperm cells that are each we call haploid. I want to draw a little N in there, right? So each one has the N number, meaning we've separated homologous pairs from each other during the process of meiosis one and meiosis two. And so this is, is, is a, a one of the primary steps. And again, that's stimulated via the hormones we've discussed earlier. Now, in, in addition, the, the, this, the importance of going from diploid to haploid, this is so that we can create this um, 
this set so we can have one set of chromosomes that will pair up with ultimately a set of chromosomes uh, from the from the egg. Now, during this process of meiosis, we also have a step in meiosis. Now, it occurs during meiosis one, and I mentioned it before as crossing over. And what that actually entails is this. Let's take, for example, I have one uh, a chromosome and it's homologous, uh, homologous pair over here. Okay, so one came from the uh, mother, one came from the father, one came from the male, one came from the female. All right, so this is one of those pairs. Okay, of course it replicates. I'm going to draw on that centromere. So another one replicates over here, and this is its centromere here. So these are homologous pairs. Okay. Now in meiosis, what happens is there is a step in which I'm going to draw it over here. A step in which this chromosome links up with one of the sister chromatids of the other chromosome so that there's a crossing over point right about here and let's say right about there so we have this crossing over and what happens at this point is that basically you have an exchange of genetic information and the result is when you finally separate homologous pairs from each other during the natural process of division uh, during meiosis, what you're going to end up with is now is one pair here. I'm just going to draw it like this. And the other one is separated over here. Now these will be in, in separate cells. But this one has, let's say, a piece of that genetic information over here. And this one over here. And I'll draw this one in blue over here. So as they're in separate cells or have been separated from each other, these are no longer identical copies connected by that centromere, which we saw previously, which again over here, those are identical copies from replication connected by this centromere right here. And the same thing goes for this one right here. Because of this crossing over event that took place right here, there's an exchange of genetic material that occurred on one of those chromatids. And so now these are no longer uh, this one is no longer identical to this one here because of that exchange of information. This increases the diversity that can occur um, during, uh, during fertilization. So this would be the first step. So this, this occurs during meiosis 1. And then in meiosis 2, meiosis 2, we're going to separate these sisters from each other. We're going to separate these two from each other, and we're end up we're going to end up with four cells. In this case, it'd be four sperm since we're talking about the male. All right, and they'll each have that chromosome. However, one of them is going to contain that little bit there, and the other one is going to have that one over there. Okay, so they're all separated. And then the, the end result is you have four cells at the end of meiosis two that each have different genetic material from each other, adding to the diversity. And they are all considered haploid. So these are all haploid, haploid cells. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so the actual process of spermatogenesis, so let's talk about that. So in this, this cartoon here, you can see this is, a, again, a cross-section through the seminiferous tubule. So if we blow up just a section of that, which is um, designated by that little black box that you see, if we blow that up, you can see here, this would be the connective tissue, the outer edge of that uh, seminiferous tubule. And so this would be the luminal side over here. So that's the lumen. And you can also see that there's these, what looks like these barriers here. I'm going to trace one of them out for you. Actually, I'll trace them both out. Those are actually the junctions between the nurse cells. So in fact, this is one nurse cell, this is another one, and this is another one. This is a big yellow blocks that you see there. Those are the nurse cells in this cartoon. At the base here, 
on the outer rim here of the uh, seminiferous tubule, you see what we refer to as a spermatogonium. So that's our stem cell. It's going to undergo uh, mitotic division. One of those uh, cells that it divide is going to stay behind and remain as a stem cell. So it keeps our, we're constantly replenishing those stem cells. And then the other cell will actually migrate more towards the lumen now uh, and undergo changes to ultimately become you can see here, migrating its way, ultimately become a sperm uh, sperm cell. And you'll notice the little designation is 2N, as I was using on the previous slide. The 2N does it just designates that it's uh, still a, a diploid cell. It still has uh, both pairs of chromosomes. And so we have what we're referring to as a spermatogonium here, all right? And then it undergoes, all right, its division here, all right? Then we still have our, um, we call it a primary spermatocyte. And then from primary spermatocyte, you see here, it undergoes meiosis one. After meiosis one, we do, we only actually produce two cells. So you can see two cells. Meiosis one though, gives us two haploid cells. Okay. Cause during meiosis one, we separate homologous pairs from each other. So we get two cells that are both uh, haploid, which is why they're designated as N. And then uh, they undergo meiosis two. So in meiosis two, we actually separate the sister chromatids from each other. And so what we end up with is four cells. And those four cells are still haploid uh, because we've already separated the homologous pairs from each other. And then those four cells will undergo uh, another step of maturation uh, referred to as spermiogenesis, which will give them sort of the, the uh, more common appearance of the sperm with the, with the head, the neck, uh, and then the tail region. And they'll eventually be released into the lumen, uh, which is filled with fluid and actually transferred to the epididymis for further maturation. Okay, so here I wanna draw out the spermatogenesis. So spermatogenesis, all right. So we're looking at spermatogenesis. And so we start out with, again, this is on the outer end, uh, the outer edge of the seminiferous tubule. We have our cell, which is 2N, or diploid. And that is our spermatogonia. And it undergoes mitosis. So therefore, it's still going to be diploid. And it's referred to as a primary spermatocyte. And so the primary spermatocyte, okay, again, one of them is going to stay as a stem cell, but the primary spermatocyte is going to actually progress and undergo meiosis one. So we've produced two cells now, but now they're each N, which means they are haploid. Okay, and then those two cells, each one of those cells is going to divide once more. And this is meiosis two. And these, by the way, these haploid cells that I just drew in here are referred to as secondary spermatocytes. So those are secondary spermatocytes. We're going to produce four new cells that are all N, meaning they're all haploid. Okay, and at, at this point, we refer to them as spermatids. So those are spermatids. And then each one of them is going to undergo... That's my flagellum, so I apologize. But this is uh, going to undergo a process called spermiogenesis to become sperm. And again, once they become sperm, um, they will still need time to mature in, in the epididymis so that they can become, uh, so they can increase their motility and so on and be ready to actually fertilize. Okay, so the males also contain what they call accessory glands. So there's actually three sets of these glands uh, in the male reproductive system. The seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, and what we refer to as the bulbo-urethral glands or the calper glands.
the uh, seminal vesicles, uh, the, or actually all the glands, are responsible for producing the, the fluid that supports the sperm uh, during the ejaculation. So this, the, um, this makes up sort of the rest of the fluid of the semen. So in the seminal vesicles, they're going to form about 65% of the seminal fluid, and it contains a, a, an abundance of fructose, uh, which actually provides energy uh, for the sperm. And that's going to empty into what we refer to as the ejaculatory duct, which I'll show you on a different, uh, a different slide. And its location is actually, there's a pair of them behind or just posterior to the bladder. Then there's the prostate gland. The prostate surrounds the urethra and some uh, structure referred to as the ejaculatory duct, just inferior to the bladder. And it primarily secretes an alkaline secretion, which helps the uh, aid in the motility um, of the sperm, as well as neutralizing the acidity uh, of the solution or of the, of the ducts. And that forms about 25% of the seminal uh, fluid. And then the Cowper glands, uh, which provides like the last small percent, uh, that's near what we call the bulb of the penis. And during sexual arousal, it produces a, a clear mucus uh, or mucoid fluid that helps to lubricate the glands of the penis or the head of the penis in, in, in preparation for intercourse. It does aid somewhat in protecting the sperm by neutralizing uh, the acidity of any residual uh, kind of urine in the urethra as well. The spermatic ducts, uh, which you see here in, the, in this anatomy uh, of, of the male, you're looking at it from the posterior aspect. So this structure up here, let me draw it over here. So this structure right here is the bladder. And behind the bladder, so we're looking at the posterior aspect of the bladder, you see this structure right here. Okay, this structure right here, that's the ampulla. So the ampulla is connected to the vas deferens. So here's the vas deferens, the epididymis, and the testes. So the sperm is initially stored in the epididymis, and when, during ejaculation, that can move through the vas deferens. And actually, some sperm can still be stored here in the, the ampulla. Uh, and then in the ampulla, you'll notice that they connect down here. This structure right here is the prostate gland. Through the middle of the prostate gland, you'll notice the prostate gland is just beneath the bladder. Through the middle of it is the uh, prostatic urethra, which connects it to the, uh, to the bladder actually above it. So this would also be the, the pathway for urine from the bladder to the prostatic uh, urethra out to the penile urethra. So they share that, uh, that similar anatomical site. But you'll see here, there's the seminal vesicles that I just spoke of. So seminal vesicles, which are secreting a high fructose type solution. Uh, that'll combine with the sperm coming from the ampulla into what we refer to as the ejaculatory duct. And then it enters into the uh, prostatic urethra. And the prostate can actually secrete um, in directly into the, the prostatic urethra there. And then you'll have uh, what we call the, the um, membranous urethra, which is just a small section there as, it, as it's moving through some of the, the muscles of the pelvic floor there. And that becomes the, uh, the penile urethra uh, after that. And so that's the, the pathway that the sperm would take all the way from the epididymis, vas deferens, ampulla, through the ejaculatory duct, into the prostatic urethra, the membranous urethra, into the penile urethra. And this is the underside of the penis, which you're seeing here, spongy tissue, um, which is continuous with the glands of, of the head or the head of the penis there, um, and also the corpus cavernosa on, uh, on more of the um, upper surface of the penis, which I'll show you a better uh, image of that in another slide. Okay, on this slide, um, we're looking at it from, uh, from a sagittal section, and you can see in this mid-sagittal section here, uh, same structure, so we'll start here. This is the testes. You can see the epididymis located uh, on really the superior and lateral poles there. And here's the, vest, the vas deferens. You'll notice that the vas deferens actually hooks over the pubic symphysis and enters into the, uh, the pelvic cavity. This structure here is the bladder. And this uh, vas deferens does not go into the bladder or through it, despite what this cartoon kind of looks like. It goes around the side of the bladder and, and, and behind it. Okay, so the bladder, so it goes actually behind the bladder where it connects with the seminal vesicle. So there's the ampulla and the seminal vesicle. And uh, you have the ejaculatory duct, okay, which is located right here. 
All right, and then you have the prostatic urethra, and here's the prostate. And then you have the very small membranous uh, uh, urethra, and then you have the penile urethra from there. What I uh, didn't mention on the previous slide, I didn't show you, but it is located there, you can look for it, is this structure right here, just underneath the prostate, um, at the, uh, the, the base of the penis here, is the calper gland, or the bulbo urethral gland. So those are our three glands. We have our seminal vesicle, prostate, and then the bulbo urethral gland there. Some structures to take note of here as well. Uh, in the penis itself, on the uh, on the top uh, top portion of the penis here, you'll see two structures, one on either side here, left and right side. You have the corpus cavernosa, okay, which actually uh, connects uh, to the to the pelvis. And then you see here, just underneath that on the inferior surface there, you have the, the glands or the head of the penis, which is continuous with the, uh, uh, the tissue that surrounds the urethra. And it goes all the way back towards the sort of what we call the, 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 the base of the penis here, in this region here. So the penis is in an erectile tissue. And so the mechanism for the erection is actually um, based on uh, vasodilation and engorgement of blood. And so what happens is you have three bodies. If we take a look at the cross section of the penis here, you have three bodies on the outside here uh, or on the top part here, which you can see. This is the uh, corpus cavernosum. So one on either side. And you'll notice that there's a, a an artery that runs deep or in the middle of that. And then there's one on the inferior side here. Uh, and that's called the corpus spongiosum. And that's the one that contains the urethra. And so uh, during arousal, you you increase blood flow to these areas, to these corpora cavernosa, because these cavernosa are actually contain what we refer to as lacunae or like little lakes, and it's surrounded by smooth muscle, as well as a, a more rigid connective tissue structure that surrounds each one of those and separates them. And so what happens is uh, during arousal, you get vasodilation of the arteries, which increases flow into these uh, lacunae and it causes them to uh, fill up with blood rapidly. And in doing so, when it fills up with blood, it expands because uh, it's like a spongy type material. So it expands and it expands rapidly against and can then compress against the more rigid connective tissue that surrounds each one of them. And in doing so, it actually can compress some of the veins that run peripherally along that more dense connective tissue. So it has twofold effect, an increase in arterial flow, which fills those areas up with blood and engorges them and at the same time that compresses the um, the more rigid connective tissue and actually pinches the uh, the venous blood so thereby reducing um, venous venous return or uh, you know venous blood flow uh, and increasing arterial blood flow so it's a change in the dynamic of flow the spongiosum uh, similar in principle in that it will engorge with blood it, it is sort of a spongy tissue uh, does not contain the same kind of rigid wall structure that's around the cavernosa, but its main function really is when it engorges is also to help keep the urethra open or patent so that ejaculation can occur. So ejaculation occurs through the urethra um, and that has to stay open. If you look at it from just the, the lateral view over here on the left, uh, you can see uh, the spongiosum over here and then the, uh, the cavernosa would be on this region right here. And the the glands or the head of the penis here, which is actually uh, continuous with the spongiosum. It's all part of the um, spongiosum. Now over here, this box over here, the mechanism by which this actually occurs is you have parasympathetic innervation to the endothelium that lines the, the blood vessels there. So this is our endothelium. All right, here's our parasympathetic nerve. And uh, when the parasympathetics stimulate the endothelium, it stimulates nitric oxide synthase in the endothelium, which means the endothelium then produce nitric oxide. Nitric oxide then can diffuse uh, to the nearby smooth muscle. So this is the smooth muscle. So it diffuses into the nearby smooth muscle and actually initiates or converts GTP into cyclic GMP through various mechanisms. And by inducing um, cyclic GMP activity, uh, it causes smooth muscle relaxation. So the net result of nitric oxide 
is to reduce is to induce smooth muscle relaxation, which causes vasodilation, therefore an increase in arterial blood flow. Phosphodiesterase 5 or PDE5 over here is really kind of constitutively on and inactivates the cyclic GMP. So if there's an abundance of nitric oxide, it overpowers the ability of phosphodiesterase 5 to inhibit it. And so it will vasodilate. However, as nitric oxide or parasympathetic inputs start to decrease, uh, the phosphodiesterase 5 can take over and cause uh, constriction. And so therefore a loss of uh, erection. So, you know, this uh, phosphodiesterase 5 is an important target for treating erectile dysfunction. So if you have, for example, sexual stimulation, which is causing the state of arousal, parasympathetics initiate or stimulate the endothelial cells to release nitric oxide. Nitric oxide um, converts inactive guanylate cyclase into active guanylate cyclase, which can then convert GTP into cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP results in vasodilation and erection. However, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, remember PDE5 degrades the cyclic GMP, so we have loss of erection, okay? Phosphodiesterase inhibitors will block the actions of PDE5. So uh, Viagra, for example, is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, blocks the actions of PDE5, therefore cyclic GMP um, stays, stays around longer at higher concentrations and maintains uh, an erection. Okay, so in the male sexual response, um, the, the nervous system plays a large role here. So prior to arousal, if there's a large sympathetic response, that actually inhibits uh, the arousal state. However, uh, in a parasympathetic state, the, the signals will produce uh, an erection via the mechanism I talked about uh, through induction of nitric oxide and cyclic GMP and so on. The sympathetics do, however, play a role after arousal in signaling uh, ejaculation. And so what it does is it, it'll actually coordinate um, the, the muscle movement and the, the contractions of the, say, the vas deferens, the seminal vesicles, and so on, to uh, secrete their fluids and to also propel the sperm through the urethra. At the same time, during orgasm, heart rate goes up, uh, respiratory rate, blood pressure, um, you know, as well as uh, an increase in skeletal muscle tone and sweating and so on. So here, uh, just to kind of touch on this, the, the, um, the sexual response, uh, this can also be found in your notes, and I apologize for the small writing here, but this is in the, the unaroused state here, and then you have the excitement phase and the plateau phase, which are just continuums uh, of the same thing, essentially, where you have parasympathetic inputs, increase in nitric oxide and cyclic GMP, engorgement of blood of the cavernosa and the spongiosum, uh, as well as contraction of the, the skin and the muscles, the dartus muscle, for example, which pulls the testes up closer towards the body. Um, and then also release of the fluid from the calper's glands or the bulbal urethral glands uh, to coat the, the, the glands of the penis um, in preparation for intercourse. And then you have what we call the, the orgasm phase, all right, which is the sensation and then the ejaculation phase. And again, it's a continuum, but it, during the orgasm phase, again, there's gonna be sympathetic input, which is going to induce a lot of the, uh, the contraction of say the, the vas deferens and the seminal vesicle and the prostate glands to start to secrete uh, the fluid into the, into the lumen of the urethras there. And, and then during the ejaculation phase, you're going to have you know, strong pulsations uh, of the bulb of the penis, which is right at the base of the penis to help project or to eject, excuse me, the, um, the seminal fluid from the penile urethra out through the glands. And then you have finally resolution uh, and refractory period. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the female reproductive system. And so to begin, we gotta talk about some of the anatomy of the female genitalia. So in this uh, sagittal section here, what you can see uh, moving from uh, anterior to posterior, uh, to start, this is the structure right here. Is, a, is analogous to the cavernosa in the males, which is an erectile tissue. Uh, it's called the clitoris. Okay, and it can be covered by what was referred to as the, the prepuce. And the prepuce is um, homologous to the foreskin in males. And you also see some of the external structures here, the uh, labia minora, which is the internal, and the labia uh, majora, which is the outer. And then as you work more towards posteriorly, 
the opening here is to the urethra, which connects to the bladder. So this, is, this structure here is the bladder. Just posterior to the bladder, the opening here is to the vagina. And then here is the cervix. And this structure just superior to the vagina is the uterus, which you can see antiflexed over the bladder in its typical position. And then connected to the uterus, you see the fallopian tubes over here and then the ovaries. We only see one of them here, but you'd have a fallopian tube on either side and two, two ovaries. And then posterior to the, the vagina, then you have the, the anal canal and then the rectum over there. Okay. And then what you're seeing here is the muscle on the floor of the, of the pelvis. Now, uh, the internal genitalia of the females are the ovaries, the uterine tubes, uterus, and the vagina. The external genitalia is comprised of the clitoris, uh, the labia minora, and the labia majora. The primary sex organ for females are the ovaries, and the secondary sex organs um, you know, are you know, other than the internal and external uh, genitalia. So we include things like the breast tissue and so on. So the uterus, the structure here, so this, in this cartoon, this would be the, uh, the vaginal canal right here. This, the structure right here, okay, right here, sorry. This is the, uh, the cervix, and this is the, what they refer to as the external os, which is the, the opening into the vaginal canal. And you see laterally along the cervix, there's um, uh, what we call the, the lateral fornix. Then you have the cervical canal, which is the canal through the cervix that opens up into the uh, the opening of the the, endo, the uterus, excuse me. And so the structure of the uterus, you see the fundus over here, and then the, the body is over there, and then the, the neck. So the, the cervix, cervical actually means neck. So for example, if somebody wears a cervical collar, uh, it's a collar that goes around the neck. Um, in the in the uterus, the cervix, this is considered the, the neck. And then you have the body, and then there's the fundus at the top there. You notice that uh, uh, laterally on either side, there'll be an opening from the uterus into what we call the fallopian tube. And the fallopian tube forms these fimbrae at the, at the end, uh, which are these like finger-like projections that come close in proximity to the ovary. The ovary is not directly connected to the fallopian tube. And you can kind of see that over here, the other ovary. You see the fimbrae over here of the, of the fallopian tube. All right, so... Uh, the, the general process here is that you'll see inside the ovary, uh, there are follicles. A follicle will, will contain uh, an oocyte. The oocyte is the egg. And so when it releases that oocyte, it goes into the fallopian tube and it travels uh, into the uterus and will implant in the uterine wall in the inner layer known as the endometrium. So the endometrium is this inner layer. Then you have the thick part, portion, which is the myometrium, which contains a lot of the muscle. Okay, and then you have the perimetrium, which is the outer part of it. So again, they would try to embed into the uh, endometrium uh, if there were any fertilization that took place. So we'll start with the ovaries. Um, so these are the female gonads, and they produce um, the you know the oocytes or the, the egg cells. So these are almond-shaped structures that are nestled in what we call the ovarian fossa of the posterior pelvic wall. They're surrounded by a tunica albuginea capsule, just like we saw with the, the testes. They have an outer cortex, which is where the germ cells develop. So that's where the oocytes are actually developing within those follicles. And then you have an inner uh, medulla, which is pretty much occupied just by the major arteries and veins. And um, each egg, okay, actually develops in its own fluid-filled follicle. So every egg has its own follicle. To give you an idea, though, of how many eggs there are, uh, at birth, there's about um, a million of these uh, OS, these eggs that are produced, and that's the end of the production of any more eggs at that point. So there's a million. Uh, by the time puberty, um, by the time of puberty, there's about 400,000, and then um, by the time uh, menopause, uh, most of them have already been, uh, or most of them are essentially gone by then. Usually throughout the lifespan of the female, uh, they'll ovulate and release about 400 eggs with a, a, with a wide range there, depending on how, how regular people's cycles are and whether or not there were pregnancies and so on. Ovulation refers to actually the bursting of one of these follicles and the releasing of the egg that it contains.
so here's the structure or this is the cartoon of the ovary and uh, you can see you know within the within that you see in the cortical region these primordial follicles these primordial follicles were actually developed during uh, early developmental stages and that's what I was referring to on the last slide as having produced uh, about a million of those uh, and you have cells called oogonia that undergo a lot of mitotic divisions and produce all these um, all these egg cells that then have a very thin layer of supporting cells around them referred to as granulosa cells and so this thin layer of granulosa cells that helps to support that egg is referred to as like a primordial follicle and they'll stay essentially locked into in, in, in uh, meiosis one until given a signal to actually grow and, and divide and so what happens is let's say it gets that signal to grow and divide it, it basically goes from a primordial follicle to a primary follicle to a secondary follicle tertiary and so on to what we get uh, what we call a mature follicle and you'll notice the oocyte in the center of that so this this little orange guy here all right that's that's the oocyte that's the egg and so this pink layer here these are our supporting cells that grow along with it and make up the follicle that surrounds and supports and nourishes that uh, that dividing oocyte. Now, usually the signal for this divide is, is hormonal in nature and, and comes about um, during puberty, which on average is you know somewhere between anywhere from like nine years old up to about 14 years or 15 years old. Uh, probably the average being about 12 years old. And so you can see as this follicle develops, it gets larger and larger. So does the oocyte itself, and it starts to develop these fluid-filled pockets called antral fluid. So the, they'll refer to that large pocket of fluid as the antrum. So sometimes this mature follicle, it'll go by several names. It'll go by the name of antral follicle, uh, vesicular follicle, because they'll refer to that fluid filled uh, area as a vesicle, or sometimes a graphene follicle. So all those are referring to the mature uh, large follicle that is essentially ready to uh, rupture and release. So you can see over here, the mature follicle, given this, the hormonal signal, will actually rupture and release the oocyte surrounded by this, you know, some of those supporting cells that will then uh, enter into the fallopian tubes of the uterus. But leftover cells that were supporting cells for that growing uh, uh, oocyte, they don't go, uh, instantly die off. Instead, they actually have a very important function here and they'll undergo some changes and become something we refer to as the corpus luteum, which will secrete hormones to help support uh, the oocytes and, uh, and the uterus. And then, the, uh, then lastly, over you know, a certain amount of time, the corpus luteum will actually involute and become atretic and just become the corpus albicans, which is essentially just a, a remnant, uh, but is non-functional. So for follicular development, uh, again, the follicles are all the supporting cells that surround the, the, the oocyte. So you see the oocyte in the middle, which is our egg. That's our primordial follicle, which, uh, which females are born with. And then you'll see that um, if given the signal, it becomes the primary, primary follicle. You see the oocyte enlarges. You see there's a thin layer of cells that support it. There's also a, uh, a layer between the oocyte and those supporting cells known as the zona pellucida, which is like a glycoprotein type matrix, uh, which is supportive to the oocyte and is actually an important structure, particularly during fertilization. So over here, what you're noticing is the, the oocyte um, is you know, still enlarged and you notice that the layers of cells surrounding it have grown. So it becomes thicker, there's more of these cells and the granulosa layer, which is the original layer, um, becomes quite thick and it starts to develop another type of cell on its outer rim out here on the outside called a theca cell. So the granulosa cells and theca cells are important in supporting the, uh, the oocyte. And then the follicle further develops and it's just an increase in the number of cells, an increase in the thickness of the theca cells and the theca cell number. We also start to develop a fluid filled sac there called the antrum. So this is what we call an early antral follicle. And then our mature follicle, which is the big one you see down here, you can see the multiple layers. You see the granulosa cells in the inner layer. And then you see the theca cells, which is the outer darker uh, colored layer. And then you'll notice that the antrum surrounds most of the oocyte. The oocyte still keeps a small layer of cells surrounding it, all right, known as the, the cumulus ophrys. Okay, so there's the cumulus ophrys. Uh, 
and it's still connected by a little stalk right there to the other granulosa cells. Now this is just the histological side showing you the, uh, the follicle. And so in, in the follicle here, you see the multiple layers you have out here. So let's see if we can circle it here, I'm gonna circle it in blue for a second here so we can see the whole follicle. And uh, <clears throat> you have the, the theca, which I may have actually missed some of them actually in my drawing here, but you have the theca layer right here. You have the granulosa layer right there. And then this, this structure right here is the antrum. So that's a fluid filled antrum. Here's the oocyte. And then you can see the zona pellucida, which is that glycoprotein that surrounds it. All right. And then the cumulus ophorus, uh, which, are the, which are the supporting granulosa cells that are still surrounding the oocyte. So oogenesis and called the sexual cycle. The sexual cycle uh, is the more common term for it now. Uh, it used to be referred to as the, the menstrual cycle. So in oogenesis, we're talking about egg production. So it's the same idea as we talked with, with the uh, talked about with spermatogenesis, where we have to go from a diploid to haploid cells. And um, but the process, you know, differs quite a bit, especially in its timing. So in this case, we're going to produce haploid gametes by means of meiosis again. So uh, the eggs will also do meiosis one and meiosis two. And the difference though here is that instead of producing four haploid cells, the, uh, the egg undergoing division is only gonna produce one, uh, one haploid cell. The other three, it still produces them, but it produces what we refer to as a polar body, which is just like a very, very tiny cell with very little cytoplasm. And it often just they just die off. So, uh, so this is where we differ quite a bit from the sperm production, where all of them we have four equal sized haploid cells. In females, you end up with just uh, you end up with four haploid cells, but three of which die off, and we refer to them as polar bodies because they're very small. And then one cell that's supposed to survive. And uh, so there's going to be some cyclical hormonal changes that we're going to discuss in, in in promoting this growth and differentiation in these divisions. And so there, there's also going to be changes that occur in the uterus as well as in the ovary every month, and then the cycle repeats itself. So the sexual cycle is what we refer to this monthly um, cycle, and uh, you know this this occurs obviously when pregnancy doesn't um, doesn't intervene with it. So it consists of two interrelated cycles. What happens is there's two parts of the sexual cycle that are occurring simultaneously. So you have what's happening in the ovaries, and we refer to that as the ovarian cycle. And then you have what's happening simultaneously to the uterus, and that's referred to as the uterine cycle. So these are parallel changes. So there's two different things happening in the ovary versus what's happening in the uterus, but uh, the, the changes that are occurring have to occur simultaneously because when the ovary ultimately releases its egg, the uterus has to already have been prepared for it. So this slide is showing you the, the oogenesis uh, and the development of the follicle uh, sort of side by side. Uh, so what happens is just looking at the egg, not the follicle as a whole, but just the egg, in the uh, before birth, let me change the color of this though. So before birth, remember during development, we, we, uh, we actually have undergo mitosis. Okay, so we have oogonia. So similar to spermatogonia, we have oogonia, which are diploids, that's 2N, and they'll undergo mitosis. So they'll undergo a lot of mitosis and produce identical cells and we refer to them as primary oocytes, similar to the primary spermatocytes. So we have the primary oocytes. Now the, these primary oocytes, however, um, will actually start to undergo meiosis 1, but they'll get locked in meiosis 1 Okay, without any, without progressing all the way through meiosis one, so they end up getting kind of frozen in meiosis one, and they stay that way, um, some of them for their entire lifetime, or some of them until they get signaled to actually uh, move or to progress during puberty. So this happens all during development, where they get locked into uh, meiosis one and stay as a primary oocyte up until puberty. So that's when we have now adolescence. All right, during puberty. Uh, all the way from the, uh, the average age of about 12 up to about the age of 50 or so, which would be menopause, uh, you're gonna, there's, you, there's gonna be this cycle that's gonna be repeated every month. And so what happens is some of these cells, some of these oocytes will then progress through meiosis one, 
and finish meiosis one and produce a secondary oocyte. Now you'll notice that there's a difference here. We have two cells here that have been produced, this little one over here and this one. So there were two cells that produced, but one of them had very little cytoplasm. Remember, we really only want to produce one cell that has an abundance of cytoplasm uh, and to support and be able to provide the nutrients uh, for possible fertilization with the sperm. So what we're going to do is, you know, what's going to happen is the there's going to be a one of the cells is going to have very little cytoplasm. We're going to refer to it as a polar body, and that just dies off. So meanwhile, this now secondary oocyte has completed meiosis one, and it's going to get locked in meiosis two. Now it's not going to finish meiosis two, okay? And in fact, it will never finish meiosis two unless it's fertilized. So that's the key. It doesn't finish meiosis two ever unless there's fertilization. So here we have our secondary oocyte. It gets ovulated, meaning it gets released from the follicle. It's moving through the fallopian tubes, okay? And that's why it says here, if it's not fertilized, okay, then it just dies. If it becomes fertilized, so here's the sperm, okay, so the haploid sperm, meaning the haploid egg, it will finish meiosis two, and that's where the next polar body gets released, okay? So that's where it divides again, but one's a polar body, and that's going to die off. And now you have a diploid cell, which we refer to as a zygote. Now, in terms of how this oocyte uh, compares with the follicle development, it's happening, again, it's a simultaneous type thing, but what's happening here is the, the, this oogonia are located in a follicle. So there's just a, a small layer of supporting cells or granulosa cells that surround this primary oocyte. And so when it ceases to develop any further, uh, you know, after the, uh, after the female is born, it'll still be what we call a, a primordial follicle trapped in uh, you know, meiosis one, or the oocyte trapped in meiosis one. And then during puberty, if, if the primordial follicle is signaled to, um, to grow, it'll go from a primary follicle to a secondary follicle, tertiary follicle, where the follicle gets larger and larger, as I've discussed in the previous slides, where the antrum develops and ultimately leads to ovulation and the formation of the corpus luteum. The oocyte that's located within those follicles will remain, um, after its signal, will actually remain locked in meiosis two, as I suggested before. So what happens is, uh, during this time, uh, in the growing follicle, it'll, un it'll finish meiosis one and it'll get locked in meiosis two. And it'll stay in meiosis two unless fertilization occurs. Okay, so oogenesis. Um, this slide is actually reiterating some of the points that I made previously, um, in that the oogonia which are those stem cells, they'll multiply you know, many times over via mitosis and produce uh, millions, like six to seven million uh, primary oocytes that uh, will pause in meiosis one, specifically prophase. And um, you know, most of those will actually degenerate via a process known as atresia by the time the female is born. So there's usually about a million or so. So that by the time uh, the female reaches puberty, there's usually about 400,000 oocytes that remain. And uh, over a lifetime, like, as I mentioned before, they usually ovulate approximately about 400 times, give or take again, depending on, on the person. The sexual cycle, also known as the menstrual cycle, uh, on average, it lasts about 28 days. Now, that there's a wide range from about 25 to maybe 35 days long. And uh, there's a, a complex uh, arrangement of hormones and signaling that occurs, but uh, it starts with like the hypothalamus which regulates the pituitary, uh, pituitary gland. And then there's the pituitary hormones, which regulate the ovaries. And then the ovaries secrete hormones that are gonna regulate the uterus. And there's feedback from, all, from, from the ovaries and the uterus. So the basic hierarchy basically goes from the hypothalamus, pituitary, ovary, the ovary talks to the uterus. And uh, the ovaries are gonna exert that, the feedback control over the hypothalamus and the pituitary um, under normal conditions, but the uterus can as well. And so there's a sort of a complex arrangement here based on this hierarchy. Okay, so in the sexual cycle, um, the cycle actually begins with the follicular phase, which is part of the ovarian cycle. So rem reminding you that the sexual cycle has uh, the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle, and they occur simultaneously. So uh, in the ovaries, we have a follicular phase. So this is what's happening with the follicles, the growing of the follicles. And so it starts with uh, menstruation, which occurs usually in the first 
or usually lasts for about three to five days of the cycle. So that's the beginning of the cycle. And then, uh, you know, at the same time, the uterus is replacing uh, lost tissue from the menses uh, via mitosis. And, um, and at the same time, in the ovaries, the cohort of follicles are growing. So we'll talk about them separately and what's happening. Uh, ovulation in the ovaries occurs around day 14. So at the end of the follicular phase, ovulation occurs. So that would be the rupture of the follicle in the ovary to release the egg. And then the, uh, the follicle that is left behind will become the corpus luteum. In the next two weeks of our 28-day cycle, all right, we, we enter into what's called the luteal phase. So after ovulation, the ovaries under, in, undergo uh, a change that now enters into what they call the luteal phase. And the corpus luteum stimulates uh, the uterus, the uterus is endometrium, to secrete and start to thicken and so on. And if pregnancy does not occur, the endometrium in the uterus starts to break down in the last two days of the luteal phase. And then menstruation begins and the cycle starts over. So in the luteal phase, uh, this is primarily just the corpus luteum secreting hormones to support the uterus in case of pregnancy occurring. Now, this is looking at the ovarian cycle as, as a whole here. You can see here we have, okay, the primary follicle. So if we had a primordial follicle that was stimulated to become primary, which became secondary. So you see the growing follicle. Uh, the oocyte uh, in the follicle has finished meiosis one, is locked in meiosis two. You see this enlarging follicle here. You can see the oocyte there. You can see the antrum and all that. So we have our tertiary, which is really our, our mature follicle or graphene follicle. And then there's ovulation. So here's day 14, which is depicted by this arrow right here. So the follicular phase is the growing and developing of the follicles to maturity to reach the point of ovulation. Ovulation is then the release of the egg with its, some of its surrounding uh, supporting cells, okay, the cumulus ophrys and so on. The follicle that gets left behind in the ovary becomes the corpus luteum. The oocyte that's been uh, ejected is now at this point uh, traveling through the fallopian tubes towards the uterus. So what's left behind in the ovary here is the corpus luteum, which is the remnant of that follicle, which actually starts to secrete uh, different hormones in high abundance, like progesterone, for example. And then that's going to be the next 14 days. And this is the luteal phase, which someone's kind of blocked by my video. But if there is no pregnancy, ultimately the corpus luteum is going to involute and become the corpus albicans, which is just a remnant, non-functional. And then new primordial follicles will be uh, you know, ready to be kind of initiated for the next cycle. So if they get initiated and so on. Now, one thing I want to clarify with this is, is to understand that these primordial follicles, we do not go in from, in the follicular phase, in 14 days, we don't go from a primordial follicle all the way to a tertiary and mature follicle that then ovulates. No, the, the reality is that actually every 14 days when the follicular phase starts, it's actually initiating follicles that are already pretty mature. Okay, they might be in the secondary stage or the tertiary stage already. And so over that 14 days, it's going to stimulate a secondary or a tertiary follicle to the point of ovulation. So it'll get one of those follicles to survive and ovulate. Meanwhile, there'll be, you know, subsets of primordial follicles and primary follicles in various stages in the ovary. Uh, so every single time this follicular phase develops, it will stimulate these primordial follicles. It will stimulate the primary follicles to can further develop. And so what you have is a series of these going on at the same time. So cohorts of them that are in various state, uh, developmental stages every single month until they reach the secondary or tertiary point, at which point they, they're sort of sort of the next up, if you will, to, to be the ones to ovulate. Now at the top of this, the hormones that are regulating this are the ones that we've discussed before, which are the FSH and the LH, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And so you'll see that FSH uh, goes up early on uh, in the follicular phase because it's a follicle stimulating hormone. So its level starts to increase to stimulate the growth of the follicles. And the luteinizing hormone levels will also be uh, fairly elevated as well. And then you'll notice during ovulation that there's a surge in LH, whereas there's kind of just a, a little bump in the FSH there.
that LH surge is very important uh, for ovulation. Without the LH surge, there is no ovulation. So let's talk about the hormone uh, that are involved in this. So gonadotropin releasing hormone, or GNRH, increases FSH and LH release um, at the beginning of the follicular phase. So when the, on the first day of menses, uh, which lasts again three, about three to five days, uh, what's happening is the GNRH levels start to rise, and that stimulates the anterior pituitary to release uh, high levels of FSH and LH. That stimulates the ovary, uh, the follicles in the ovaries, to start to develop. So usually it'll start to stimulate a, a cohort of follicles to continue maturing. And uh, <clears throat> what happens is the growing follicle, in response to the FSH and the LH, is going to actually produce estradiol, which is one of the estrogens we spoke about. And so the increase, so it'll start to increase its production of estrogen as it matures. So the more mature it is, the more estrogen it's producing. Uh, at the same time, the estrogen is increasing the number of FSH and LH receptors on the follicle. So it's actually, it's a positive feedback in the sense that the estrogen is acting on the follicle itself to increase its own sensitivity by having more and more receptors for SS, FSH and LH. <clears throat> Estrogen, once in the blood, though, however, when it feeds back to the uh, anterior pituitary or to the hypothalamus, uh, is actually a concentration-dependent effect. So early on, when the estrogen levels are relatively low, uh, that actually inhibits FSH and LH release. And so it decreases FSH and LH, but even though it's decreasing FSH and LH, it's decreasing their secretion. So it's not being released from the cells. However, it seems to increase the synthesis and storage of FSH and LH. So it's inhibiting its being able to be released, but it's really kind of stockpiling FSH and LH in those cells. Because what happens later on is the estrogen, as the follicle gets more and more mature, it's releasing more and more estrogen. Um, over time, it, that estrogen level actually uh, peaks and you get a, a, a large concentration of estrogen. And so what happens is with that time-dependent release of high levels of estrogen, it actually stimulates the release of gonadotropin releasing hormone, or GNRH, from the hypothalamus, which actually causes the release of LH and FSH, and which causes the surge. So, in other words, estrogen early on uh, during the follicular phase is relatively low. It's being produced more and more, but it's relatively low, and it has an inhibitory effect on the hypothalamus and the pituitary in terms of secretion of FSH and LH. However, though they start to stockpile FSH and LH inside their cells, and then uh, towards the end of the follicular phase, uh, the estrogen levels increase, uh, and during that you know, increase in estrogen concentration, that actually stimulates GNRH release from the hypothalamus, which stimulates the release of that, LS, uh, that LH and FSH, which had been stockpiling this whole time. So it creates a large concentration or a surge in the bloodstream, which actually is what, uh, what triggers the induction of ovulation. Okay, so here I wanna draw out uh, the hormonal pathway. So we're gonna start here at the top, it's gonna to be GNRH. So this is gonadotropin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. And so that level would be increased at the beginning of the sexual cycle. And then that will stimulate the release of FSH plus LH from the anterior pituitary. And in turn, that will cause the stimulation of the follicles. And the follicles, again, located in the ovary. So that stimulates the follicles. And then the follicles in response to that are going to release or produce estradiol or estrogens. Now, the uh, the estrogen that's being produced can actually cause a little positive feedback loop with the follicles. So as the follicle produces the estrogen, the estrogen actually um, causes the follicle to increase the number of FSH receptors it has, as well as uh, increase the number of uh, LH receptors that it has. So what happens is ultimately the follicle becomes more and more sensitive to FSH and LH and causes the follicle to grow and develop even faster. Um, in addition, the estrogen that's being produced is going to act on the uterus, specifically the endometrial wall, and 
that's going to cause a proliferation of the endometrial lining during this time. So the estrogen acts there. Now, as the estrogen being produced from the follicles, uh, as it initially starts to, to increase, is that still at a very uh, a, a relatively, I should say, relatively low concentration. So this relatively low concentration has a feedback to the hypothalamus as well as the anterior pituitary. The feedback here is actually complex, though, because relatively low estrogen levels cause in the anterior pituitary cause it to inhibit. I'm going to put a little negative sign and in, inhibit uh, secretion, secretion of FSH and LH. However, it stimulates the production of it in the cells uh, as well as the storage. So production and storage of FSH and LH. So what happens is it starts to accumulate those hormones within the cells, but it's not secreting it. So the FSH, LH blood levels would be going down at this time. Uh, but the cells will be producing more and more of it and sort of stockpiling in those cells. Now the, the gonadotropin releasing hormone would be inhibited with these low levels of estrogen. So now this is occurring again early in the follicular phase uh, within the ovary. Okay, and then again during that time, as the estrogen levels are, are increasing, it is still stimulating the uterus as well. So now, let's say we're further along in the follicular phase now. And so as we go along further in the follicular phase and we're approaching uh, ovulation, we have one, uh, one mature follicle that has survived and it's producing a lot more estrogen. And it's, you know, it's quite large at this point. So relatively the estrogen concentration has gone up uh, has increased uh, significantly. And so the result of that is this. So let's get rid of our inhibitory responses here for a second. And instead, what's going to happen here now in as we approach ovulation is the estrogen is primarily going to give a positive feedback or stimulate the release of GnRH, which can also stimulate FSH and LH release. Now remember, early in the follicular phase, FSH and LH was being inhibited being, from being released. However, it was stockpiling that, uh, those hormones within the cell. So when, it's, when estrogen levels increase, it stimulates GnRH to release FSH and LH, but it's going to release it at very high, like high concentrations very suddenly. So we get that surge particularly a surge in LH. So FSH does go up, but LH is very vital. So the luteinizing hormone surge is important for ovulation. So that surge is going to stimulate the follicle uh, to, to then undergo ovulation. So I'm going to draw that over here. So this is ovulation. And the follicle itself becomes the corpus luteum. All right, so that surge, this LH surge, stimulated ovulation, became the corpus luteum, and now it's going to enter into what we call the luteal phase. And so the corpus luteum will secrete uh, estrogen, just like the follicle did, plus progesterone. So progesterone is now the new one that's being added from the corpus luteum. So uh, the corpus luteum is actually very, very sensitive to luteinizing hormone. And in fact, the follicle, which had been developing more and more FSH and LH uh, receptors, is now very sensitive to the LH uh, hormone. And the luteinizing hormone stimulates the corpus luteum to secrete estrogen and progesterone, particularly progesterone here. The high levels of progesterone will also act on the uterus. So the estrogen and progesterone will continue to act on the uterus to develop the uterus and thicken the endometrial lining there. At the same time though, this estrogen and progesterone that's being produced by the corpus luteum will now act to inhibit, I'm gonna get rid of this, will now act to inhibit the release of GnRH, FSH, and LH. So that in this way, uh, after ovulation, the, the ovary is no longer going into any follicular phase or follicle development because it's going to suppress those hormones now with this high level of estrogen plus this high level of progesterone. Now keep in mind, 
that the corpus luteum is responding to LH in order to secrete estrogen and progesterone. So it starts to inhibit its own, um, its own signal to release. And what happens is as it gradually drops off the luteinizing hormone levels due to its negative feedback, uh, this takes usually, again, about 12 to 14 days. So what happens is, as it inhibits its own LH stimulation, progesterone and estrogen levels start to decline at the end of the luteal phase. The result is that uh, the corpus luteum uh, completely stops secreting and involutes and becomes the corpus albicans, which is just an inert structure. And then estrogen and progesterone can no longer... Uh, can no longer stimulate the uterus uh, and help to support the growing endometrium. And so the endometrium of the uterus uh, sloughs off and uh, the, the cells there will die off and become part of the, the menses. Okay, so this cartoon is really just depicting um, when estrogen levels start to rise um, towards the, the end of the follicular phase as we're approaching ovulation. The, the rise in estrogen causes the stimulation of stimulation of the release of GnRH, which can also stimulate the release of LH uh, and FSH. And then that's, um, that's going to uh, cause a surge, which results in down here, unfortunately my video is cutting off some of that, but it results in a surge that, that uh, results in ovulation. So again, the LH surge is absolutely necessary for, for ovulation. Now in the uterine cycle, what happens here now is this is, again, this is parallel to what's going on in the, in the ovary. So again, you have the, the menstrual phase, okay, which is day one to about day five or so. Uh, but it also has three other phases, a proliferative phase, a secretory phase, and then a, a premenstrual phase, which is blocked by my video, it's a premenstrual phase, which you can kind of see up here, all right? That's our premenstrual phase. Uh, so initially we have that menstrual phase. So this is actually the discharge or sloughing off of the tissue. So let me kind of explain what we're looking at here. This is the thickness of the, the endometrial tissue. And you can see here this kind of blue, blue line right here. All right, this blue tissue. That is the, uh, the basal layer. So that basal layer stays consistent throughout the entire cycle there. And in fact, um, that's where what's going to be stimulated by the hormones. Uh, at the beginning of each cycle. So you'll notice that the uh, functional layer on top of that, which is like the pinkish layer, it starts to increase in thickness, not the basal layer. What ends up happening is the, the, the basal layer gets stimulated by the increasing uh, estrogen levels, which at this point are, are still fairly low, but the estrogen coming from the ovary stimulates the production of, uh, or the, the, the initiation of mitosis uh, so cells start to divide, uh, start to vascularize. And so you see, you know, the blood vessels and the cells, they start to grow and the, the, the endometrium of the uterus becomes thicker and thicker. And then uh, all the way up until we have our, our surge in estrogen, which you can see here, which causes ovulation in the ovary. In the uterus, what's happening is uh, we switch over from the pro proliferative phase after ovulation into what we call the secretory phase. So what happened is in the proliferatory phase, estrogen was actually not only thickening up the, um, the endometrial layers there, but it was also uh, increasing the number of progesterone receptors. And so um, it's increasing its sensitivity to progesterone. So after ovulation, when the corpus luteum, which starts to secrete high amounts of progesterone, the progesterone in addition with the, so here's the progesterone, in addition with the est high estrogen levels, causes the secretory phase. So we get, again, further thickness, but most of the thickness coming here is not necessarily from mitosis, but from secretion of the cells and accumulation of fluid in that interstitial space, um, as, as well as you can see uh, some of the glandular tissue starts to coil, which you can kind of see here, you see the coiling of some of the glandular tissues uh, and further development of the blood vessels and secretion of glycogens and, and, uh, and proteins in there and kind of thickening it up, thickening it up overall. And then uh, finally, if, if there is no fertilization, the corpus luteum in about 14 days will involute. And that's a fairly fixed time. So even if, even if females have different variations in, in the length of their, their sexual cycle, uh, 
the uh, the corpus luteum is fairly fixed in about a 14-day lifespan, essentially. So usually most of the variability in cycle comes in the during the follicular phase, not during the luteal phase of the ovary. So in the uterus, in response to this, again, we have this um, corpus luteum secreting progesterone and estrogen, which stimulates further thickening and more secretions. And if the, uh, if the corpus luteum then involutes and dies off, that's when the premenstrual phase will start, and you'll see that uh, the, the, drop, the drop in progesterone and estrogen that was being secreted by the corpus luteum results in um, spasms of the, the blood vessels and ischemia. And what happens is the, these, this, this, this you know, spastic or closure of these blood vessels causes this acute ischemia, and the cells start to die off and slough off. Uh, and there can be bleeding and so on. And so the menstrual fluid is actually a mixture of, of some of this dead cellular debris as well as the, the blood and some of the fluid. And uh, that enters, you know, that, uh, that starts the, the menstrual cycle and then the whole thing starts over again. So what happens is uh, if there is fertilization, then the fertilized egg gives feedback to the corpus luteum to keep it um, to keep it alive and to keep it producing estrogen and progesterone to maintain the endometrium of the of the uterus so that uh, uh, so that that stays alive and can nourish the growing embryo. So this is a kind of a, a summary of you know the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle during the uh, during the overall sexual cycle. So you can see the GnRH. And FSH and LH levels, all right, so this stimulates the anterior pituitary to release the FSH and LH, which in the ovarian cycle stimulates uh, the follicular phase up until we have ovulation. And then that's releasing the oocyte into the fallopian tube. And then here you have uh, the, corp the formation of the corpus luteum, which you can see here in yellow, which secretes progesterone and estrogens. And it can ultimately become the corpus luteum, or excuse me, the corpus albicans, um, if, if it involutes and there's no feedback from the uterus. Now, during the follicular phase, the follicle is producing more and more estrogens. And I said the estrogens have a feedback mechanism uh, on, the, on the pituitary and the hypothalamus, which causes the surges and so on that I spoke about. But the estrogens also stimulate the uterine cycle so that it uh, continues to thicken during the proliferative phase. And then during the corpus luteal phase, it's releasing progesterone and estrogen. And so that's when we enter into the secretory phase of, um, of the uterine cycle. And then again, if, the, if there's no feedback, we enter, we enter into the premenstrual phase and so on. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of the corpus luteum, the corpus luteum is very sensitive to uh, luteinizing hormone. And so that's why you see this over here, the luteinizing hormone. So remember, the mature follicle had developed more and more FSH and LH receptors. And so even after it ruptures during ovulation uh, and it becomes the corpus luteum, the corpus luteum has a lot of LH receptors. And so it's stimulating the corpus luteum to release progesterone and estrogens. However, though, the high levels of estrogen and progesterone will actually feed back. So this will actually feed back and inhibit GnRH, FSH, and LH. So during this time, the uh, follicle-stimulating hormones drop off, and so does luteinizing hormone. And this prevents uh, further maturation of any other follicles during this time. And so this is that's important to kind of halt all the, that activity. Now, at the same time, uh, as those levels are dropping, that means the LH levels are dropping, which is stimulating the corpus luteum. But since the corpus luteum has a lot of LH receptors, it can kind of survive for you know for a little while longer. So what happens is, as the LH levels drop further and further during that 14-day period, it eventually starts to produce less and less uh, progesterone and estrogen, and eventually will become the corpus albicans. And then so once that dies off and the estrogen progesterone levels drop off, GnRH levels rise again because it's not being inhibited, and so therefore will, the, the FSH levels will rise, the LH levels will rise, and the cycle will start all over.